welcome and thank you for joining us on Zoom. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. Today's presenter is Mark Schumann. He earned his doctorate in Latin American history at the University of Texas, Austin. He has been a professor in the Departments of History at the University of Miami, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, the National University of Uruguay, and is Professor Emeritus at Florida International University. His publications, five books and over 40 articles, focus on Argentina and urban and family history in Spanish America. He has been the recipient of grants from the Fulbright Program, the Social Science Research Council, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, among others. He is also a member of our GMAL Board of Directors and serves as Vice President of our board. It's always a delight to have Dr. Schumann with us. Thank you, Mark, for today's talk. Thank you, Gloria, for your kind words. Um, I have been coached by the uh, tech guru of our group, Gloria Palmer, um, who instructed me as to what I need to do to share my screen. So um, I'm assuming that you can all see what I can see, a delightful hue of blue. And I want to start by getting some consensus, likely, that until the late 70s and 19, late 60s and 1970s, uh, women who sought uh, national political leadership faced insurmountable uh, obstacles that kept them out of public view. And it would be hard to remember the names of women in executive authority at the national level anywhere in the world, except maybe Indira Gandhi and Golda Meir and not many more. Imagine then a largely uneducated young woman who with no political expertise whatsoever would by the age of 25 become the revered and feared symbol of a mass political movement one that would sweep her lover into the top elected office and her with him of one of the wealthiest countries in the aftermath of World War II. This was a young woman who attracted worldwide attention and recognition and no one who laid eyes on her or who was at the receiving end of her actions or words could fail to have a strong response. She sought and received international media attention and created a mystique and aura that remains vibrant to this day. This was a woman who garnered the attention of musical lyricists and movie directors and the adulation of children. And this was Evita Perón. So we want to start out by recognizing that women in Argentina had a long history of public engagement, principally divided into two arenas. On the conservative side, public spirit, spirited patrician women addressed child and family welfare needs. And starting in 1825, the provincial government of Buenos Aires and later the national government charged women belonging to the city's elite families with the stewardship of the principal institution responsible for the well-being of abandoned children. The charitable society or Sociedad de Beneficencia was Argentina's oldest voluntary welfare organization. Its officers were well connected to the male only halls of power from whom they received funds through the legislative budgetary processes along with the largesse of presidents. The other category of public sphere activities and activism came starting in the late 19th century among women, women of the left who agitated during this period when labor unrest was at its peak. In 
The Argentine left was splintered into various ideological branches, including anarchists, anarcho-syndicalists, socialists, and later on communists. And women's participation reflected the objectives and strategies of the movements that they served. Not all of them, however, advanced women's equal, uh, equality. Anarchists, for example, followed their core principles of denying the legitimacy of the state, any state, along with rejecting established norms and thus opposed protective labor legislation, including legislation to improve um, women's and children's conditions in factories. Anarchists' opposition to those who advocated for women's emancipation and their criticism of women who took up uh, work during the war in the absence of men would eventually uh, contribute to the erosion of their appeal worldwide by the late 1910s. And throughout the left, men and women within labor organizations operated along separate spheres. Most leftist organizations, together with their middle class counterparts, functioned in accordance to a traditional realm of gender distinctions. And as the historian Asuncion Labrin noted, neither anarchists nor socialists of either gender could completely tear themselves away from the patriarchal model of the family or the illusion of the home as an oasis of happiness. Such a model was built upon the unquestioned acceptance of the physical weakness of the female sex, an ideology which had first served as the basis for questioning the female presence in the workplace and for urging the restriction of certain occupations to the male. In addition, the cultural reverence for motherhood remained deeply rooted across class positions from workers to the middle and upper classes. The possibility of changes in the power relationships between men and women was never expressed as a subversion of their sexual roles. Instead, that possibility was based on the understanding that women should not be more like men, but should instead climb the intellectual ladder to be their cerebral equals. Socialists and anarchists did not believe in the intellectual inferiority of women. They firmly upheld their equality in intelligence and intellectual abilities, and thus saw their principal male role as one of enlightening, if you will, women through education. But women's political emancipation, that was something else. And no one on the left, from the most radical to the mildly reformist, entertained notions of gender equality because both men and women largely shared a disposition to preserve their respectively traditional sexual and social roles. So, what were Evita's views on gender relations? Did she demonstrate an evolution from these traditions that remain culturally normative, even in an era starting in the early 1900s to the 1940s that witnessed dramatic social and economic change? As we will see, Evita's actions were certainly not those of a prim, demure, and submissive woman, and yet, her self-presentation and self-descriptions would fit neatly into the traditional norms in unexpectedly conventional ways. What Evita represented depended largely on where you stood. And taken together, these perspectives yielded wildly contradictory opinions. Evita was humanely inspired. She was evil. She was saintly. She was base. She was elegant. She was unique. 
she was common. But more than anything else, Evita was the inheritor of a national history and a product of her time. So this evening, we will explore the life of Evita Perón. And we will see that depictions of her in outlets of popular culture, such as Broadway musicals perhaps, lack explanatory power. We will understand her activities instead as extensions of a society and a political system undergoing tension and riddled with challenges to the status quo. We will see her as emblematic of the conflict-ridden paths that Argentina experienced on the way to modernization. We will see that feminism had alternative meanings to the ones we hold today and that they reflected shared cultural values. And in sum, we will see her in the context of larger forces and understand how she fit into them. Eva Duarte's rise to national prominence in the early 1940s can be understood only within the context of Argentina's fast-paced economic and dem demographic changes, which had been developing since the turn of the century. Nations that experienced significant populations included the United States, starting in the last couple of decades of the 19th century up to World War I, except that in the end, population growth in Argentina up to 1930, resulting from mass immigration, amounted to an enormous 60%, compared to a more modest increase in the US, where by 1930, only 3% of the population growth was accounted for by immigration. So you can imagine the much greater impact of European immigration on Argentina. As was the case of the United States, the greatest economic changes took place geographically in and around major cities and economically in the manufacturing sector. Argentine manufacturing grew steadily over the course of the 20th century from a modest 11% of GDP in 1900 to nearly 34% of GDP in 1969. And among the reasons for such growth was the increase in population, the consequence, as I said, largely of mass European immigration. This growth in turn drove up the demand for consumer goods only some of which could be satisfied by imports. These industries were characterized by the use of new capital intensive technology and by a market structure that was oligopolistic, that is a business environment in which no firms were so large that they could keep the others from having significant influence and share in the market. And this left an ample field for investment by petty entrepreneurs. And in this environment, small firms were created to service two principal sectors. First, large scale industries, such as meat freezing plants, railways and port works. And second, small entrepreneurs invested in food processing and inexpensive consumer goods. And thus, over the course of the first four decades of the 1900s, reliance on imports declined. Argentina registered its largest growth rates in the period leading to 1914 at the start of World War I. Growth indicators included population size, length of railway tracks, exports, and imports. Over the course of a half century up to 1914, Argentina had experienced one of the highest growth rates in the world for such a prolonged period of time. GDP grew at an average rate of at least 5% during this period, 
with the bulk of the growth coming from export-led activities in the rural sector. And these consisted of temperate zone foodstuffs such as cereals along with meat. Altogether, it was the pre-1930 export-led growth and massive immigration flows from Europe that built a foundation upon which a gradual diversification of production could take place. Eva Duarte was born in 1919 and she would grow and develop in this changeful order. With the start of the 20th century, Argentine growth rates were also characterized by increased complexity in the secondary industrial sector. And you can see here with my pointer that the rural sector, which in 1900 stood at over 38%, declined by the start of the eve of 1930 significantly to 31%. But industry grew at a significantly faster pace already by World War I and held that through the 1920s. In the 1940s, you see the growth rate of the urban labor force. Organized labor would come to form the core of support for Peronism as a movement and for Evita as an iconic personality. Before 1930, the labor market in the country's rural interior was largely inelastic. The pastoral sector consisting of cattle and sheep ranching did not require large numbers of staff. And the most important agricultural sector consisting of temperate zone cereal production was highly mechanized. For its part, labor in the economy's industrial sector was located largely in and around the major cities and particularly in the city of Buenos Aires and its environments. It presented a more dynamic wage picture Prior to 1930, this labor force consisted primarily of European immigrants and their children. And urban labor in that period reflected the flows of transatlantic migration, which in turn responded to economic conditions, both inside Europe and inside Argentina. A data on real wages between 1900 and 1930 indicated a relatively healthy urban labor sector compared to some European cities. So for example, hourly wage rates in Buenos Aires compared very favorably to Paris and Marseille between 1911 and 1914. You can see wage rates over here from 1904 to 1940, right? Even the unskilled workers came out to be relatively better. But look at the index of real wages in the federal district starting in 1909 with a dramatic improvement in real wages by 1940. And much of it dependent on the heavy industrial sector, railway employees, for example, shut up dramatically during this period. The positive differential in the real wages in and around the city of Buenos Aires acted as a pull factor, drawing workers from the interior, supported further in the 1940s by a negligible unemployment rate. Now, cities have always appealed to the rural imagination. And thus, internal migration from poorer rural areas to dynamic urban centers accelerated in the 1930s. And this was true whether to Buenos Aires or to Chicago. By 1947, 
only 40% of the population was born in Greater Buenos Aires. 37% came from the, in, in, the interior of the country and 23% came from Europe. So that internal migrants were becoming an important demographic factor in and around the city. And they tended to settle in the industrial suburbs where many were employed in the meat processing plants owned largely by British and North American corporations. For their part, European immigrants who formed an important segment of the industrial labor sector had, as you might recall, a legacy of union militancy. Drawing from their European ideological antecedents, they had formed the bulk of anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist and socialist groups dating back to the early 1900s. They were organized and highly experienced in labor militancy. Compared to their native Argentine counterparts within the labor sector, these leftist labor organizations would demonstrate a more internationalist perspective and be less eager to participate in the populist and nationalist politics advanced by Peronism. So this then was the economic and demographic setting in which Juan Perón and Eva Duarte would forge an alliance starting in 1944 based on equal parts personality, social policies, and opportunism. Eva Duarte was born on May 7th, 1919, to Juana Ibarguren in the small rural town of Junin in the Pampas of the province of Buenos Aires. Her father, Juan Duarte, owned a middle-sized ranch and had his own family, but maintained a years-long extramarital relationship with Juana Ibarguren. That relationship came to an end not long after Eva was born. And when Duarte left, all financial support for his lover and illegitimate children came to an end. Juan Duarte died when Eva was six years of age, ending all possibilities of a father-daughter reconciliation. Juan Ibarguren's family survived on informal unemployment, taking in sewing and working in domestic uh, help activities. And eventually, with the help from one of the older sons, she bought a house, a modest affair, into which she took boarders. These are the very lightly sketched and largely bypassed elements of Eva's early years, in large part because she would control much of her biography, in which the sections dealing with her formative years were barely mentioned, except insofar as passages would advance her underlying lifelong class grievance. By 1934, at age 15, she left behind her life in Junin to settle in the city of Buenos Aires. The means by which she left are still debated. In the musical Evita, if you remember it, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice accept the theory that she left with a reasonably well-known and married tango singer, Agustin Magaldi, after he performed in Junin's theater. Unfortunately, there are no records of Magaldi performing in Junin throughout 1934. Another theory propagated by Eva's family was that she went to Buenos Aires in the company of her mother and other siblings and was subsequently left in the care of family friends. So much for speculation. To this day, nobody knows. But what we do know is that after showing a keen interest in drama while in middle school in Junin, but otherwise without formal education or connections, <clears throat> 
This entrepreneurial teenager landed acting gigs a year later with a theater company. She also managed to get hired as a model and even landed bit roles in a few B-grade movies. But it was in radio drama that her reputation would take off starting around 1942 at the age of 23. In those days, radio personalities in comedy and drama series could rise to nationwide prominence, not too different from film stars, as was the experience in the United States as well. And this was the case with Eva Duarte, who by 1945 sought, was sought after as product sponsor and celebrity in her own right. She was under contract with the top radio national chain and starred in two daily prime, uh, prime time dramas. The military government that came to rule after a coup in 1943 arranged for the Secretariat of Labor to organize a fundraising gala in January of 1944 to raise funds for the victims of a major earthquake that had destroyed much of the western city of San Juan at the foot, at the foot of the Andes, killing many thousands and essentially destroying the city. Among the evening's star-studded performers in film, music, and radio was Eva Duarte, who was now quite famous. The host of the affair, the master of ceremonies, was a subsecretary of labor, Colonel Juan Peron. Peron and Duarte met, and as they say, in, among my people, the rest is history. Two months later, Colonel Juan Peron and Senorita Eva Duarte were openly living together. Eva undertook her affair with the same speed, strength of will, and gung-ho spirit that she had demonstrated throughout her adolescence and young adulthood. Strategies that had served her well in her quest to achieve a popular following. And Juan Perón's political career was still in ascent. He would soon become Minister of War and Vice President while still keeping his labor portfolio. The 48-year-old colonel, who had widowed six years earlier, would appear to have been born, to have been genuinely smitten by Eva Duarte. Whether each saw in the other a target of opportunity for personal satisfaction or the object of genuine affection, and I submit that the two are not contradictory, we will never know. What would become certain over time is that each advanced the other, though not equally. Now, nothing was novel about the fact of a premarital affair between Duarte and Perón. Illicit affairs between men and women was as historical a feature of Argentine society as the consumption of beef and wine. But the contours of this one made it different in several ways. First, there was nothing veiled about the affair. Evita, the diminutive name that she now had taken up in her new limelight, was as public as any lover could be, standing alongside vice president and publicly articulating her support of the vice president's official initiatives. Furthermore, she would be acting out positions of leadership normally reserved for male officials who still dominated federal agencies. Second, she arrogated presence to herself. And thus, during Perón's constant official meetings with politicians and fellow officers at their apartment, Evita did not dutifully leave the room after serving coffee, as female hosts would be expected to do. And finally, 
In a country where the professional middle and upper classes valued family and higher education, Evita represented the flaunting of bastardy and the jettisoning of formal education and credentials. In mid-1944, she used her professional acting credentials by launching a daily radio program of political propaganda in which she enrolled, she extolled, sorry, the policies being enacted by her partner at the Secretariat of Labor. These were significant and public deviations from cultural and professional norms and thus they also attracted the unwanted attention of many of Perón's fellow officers. Industrial labor agitation had long been a thorn on the side of Argentine governments dating back to the early 20th century when labor strikes and anti-capitalist activism were commonplace. Such militancy had subsided by the 1930s, but the civilian conservative and the subsequent military governments that alternated in power during the 1930s and early 1940s maintained a cool and guarded stance towards labor. For its part, the labor movement remained small and bureaucratic. All the while, industrial production continued to grow dramatically. And yet, no one had been harnessing the potential presented by such a force. Not the government with, internal, with its own internal factions, and not a labor movement beset by its own fractures. As a member, of the military government, Perón had chosen to lead the Labor Department and raised the profile and function of this heretofore minor federal agency to the level of ministerial secretariat, and then proceeded to engage the state in an overarching strategy to place it as the arbiter of labor and management. We should mention that this strategy followed the initiatives of other governments at the time as diverse as Hitler's Third Reich and the democratic administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Anti-labor practices were diminished and dormant pro-labor legislation was freshly energized. New laws were enacted labor boards of arbitration were formed and labor conditions improved along with the social security system which had been weak and relatively underfunded. One would think that Perón would have received widespread and strong support from labor organizations but this would be too much to expect from workers who had experienced a long history of resistance to governments, but especially to military governments and from organized labor's instinctive opposition to any loss of independence. In the end, communist and socialist led unions strongly resisted and Perón would need to apply some strong pressures on recalcitrant unions that would lead to violence before he could bend them to his will. He also capitalized on the ideological, ethnic, and generational divisions that had been developing within labor between old line international leftists and the cohort more recently arrived from the country's interior that embraced a more nationalist and nativist set of positions. Perón's progressive policies toward labor did not endear him to his fellow military officers who feared a growing rise on the left. His public life with Evita was not, not a determinant in these ideological positions, but their flaunting of cultural norms telescoped into the officer's sense that Perón must be stopped 
and order reimposed. And in addition, Eva Duarte's radio programs in support of Perón's policies increased the animus felt by the Army's officer corps. Civilian opposition to Perón and to Eva Duarte grew through much of 1945. Opposition came from both the left and the right, denouncing the vice president as either a Nazi sympathizer or a dangerous demagogue, depending on where you stood. On October 9th, 1945, another military coup forced the resignation of Perón from all of his offices. On October the 12th, he was arrested and confined to the island of Martin Garcia off the coast of Buenos Aires. Seeing their recent gains at risk, some labor unions that had previously lent him support now rallied for him. On October 15th, sugar workers in the northern province of Tucumán declared a strike. And I would point out that those sugar workers were native Argentines. They had no immigrant um, blood in them whatsoever, pointing to their more nationalist and nativist positions that I mentioned before. The following day, workers on several, in several cities took to the streets. The Central Committee of the General Secretariat of Laborers, the CGT, which was the umbrella organization for many industrial unions, was divided between old line and more nationalist wings, and it met to discuss strategies. After many hours of deliberations, the Central Committee voted to strike on a vote of 21 to 19, but it did not mention Perón as the cause for the strike. On the day after that, on October the 17th, workers from around the working class neighborhoods that surround the federal district began to stream into the city's center to demonstrate and to keep a vigil in front of the pink house, demanding Perón's release. It is a reflection of the strong sentiments that Evita engendered equally among her supporters and opponents that both sides accorded her a central role in the events that followed Perón's incarceration. But in fact, contrary to the widely held opinions of both Peronists and anti-Peronists, Evita had little to do with the crucial events of October 17th. Following Perón's arrest on October the 9th and fearful for her own life, she hid in friends' homes. She did try unsuccessfully to get a rid of habeas corpus for his release, but otherwise the organizational efforts required to mount the enormous sea of people that surrounded the pink house, the self-identified descamisados or shirtless ones, the Argentine versions of the sans culottes of the French Revolution, that was the work of labor organizers not Evita. Concerns about the loss of control as an estimated 100,000 largely male and rowdy supporters gathered in the geographic seat of power outside the pink house in the central plaza and with labor strikes around the countries, the generals, divided and hesitant, decided to release her own. Late on the night of October the 17th, following a rousing speech to the assembled crowd from a balcony in the pink house, Evita and Juan were reunited. Six days later, they were married in a quiet civil ceremony. Evita's marriage became as much an act of affective commitment as it was an opportunity for her to rise to the highest level of this newly ascendant modern populist politics. The pro-labor 
posture Perón had taken while in the military government now became the platform for a movement that he had led with the full collaboration of his wife with a view to the elections that would take place in February of 1946. Peronism would become as much ideological in its populist discourse as it was the manifestation of the cult of personalities, two of them, Perón and Perón. To the business class and the landed elites, this movement loomed dangerous. The Perones appeared to them as a farcical renunciation of norms, of acceptable personal behavior and civic adversarial political styles. But more, they appeared to attack institutions and hinted at social revolution. Yet, while Evita was unsparing in her description of the social order as ruinous for the poor and of the political establishment as parasitic, invariably using the term oligarchy to describe anti pairness nothing that developed after the October crisis overturned Argentina's institutional framework. Instead, the Perones oversaw a new form of political relationship in which the movement's leader and spouse articulated aspirations for the disaffected, backed by the perceived dangers of mass mobilization, which they could trigger at any time. In the elections of February 1946, widely regarded as free and fair, and with a turnout of 84%, the Peronist ticket won with 54% of the vote. I should tell you that until very recently, voting in Argentina was uh, mandatory, as is true of some countries. So you're getting a very real electoral effect at the end of the electoral process because the votes are from nearly everyone. Peronists achieved majorities in both houses of the Argentine parliament. Evita became first lady at the age of 27. To opponents, Peronism appeared as the 20th century version of the old and violent era of 19th century strongmen. But in fact, Instead of revolution or dictatorship, Peronism represented a version of populism that advanced a reformist agenda superimposed on the existing institutional scaffolding, leaving pluralist organizations largely untouched, but with elements of pressure brought on the press and new laws on slander that threatened political opponents. Capitalism too remained viable, even while the state became an increasingly important player in controlling food prices and in building vital infrastructure seen as too important to leave in private hands. And thus, railways, shipping, utilities, energy, and military equipment fell increasingly into the management by the state. But throughout such a changeful process in policies, the human touch that through multiple public acts reached out to the people was provided by Evita. How was this accomplished? Perón won the 1946 election with the support of a cross-section of the electorate, which included workers, industrialists, and portions of the middle class, but with labor providing a disproportionate underpinning of it all. Perón, however, was not fully in control of the labor apparatus. The umbrella labor organization, the CGT, the backbone of his electoral victory, was divided and Perón did not control all of its segments. Membership in the CGT grew significantly year after year, 
and growing dissatisfaction with wages and working conditions led to strikes among some of the constituent unions. In addition to the increasing number of union members, the composition of the, union, of the unions reflected the growth of the industrial sector and the economy, and thus the industrial labor component of the CGT, which had consisted of 33% in 1941, jumped significantly to 52% in 1948. And this control proved to be increasingly problematic. The process of capturing and dominating labor began in May 1946. Perón dissolved the Labor Party, which he had organized in order to run for office, and replaced it with the Peronist Party, aimed at constructing a more pliable organization. Not all labor leaders agreed with this move. Some were openly defiant, but most were grudgingly submissive or enthusiastic. Perón's next strategy was to create mechanisms to provide for labor and thereby ensure its support. But as a bureaucracy, the Ministry of Labor was historically not the most enthusiastic supporter of labor demands. And at the same time, Perón was not interested in appointing a strong individual to head this ministry fearful that the appointee might use it to build his own political base. In addition, workers insisted on getting their needs heard by Perón personally, much the style that he had encouraged earlier while Secretary of Labor. But now as president, this made for an unwieldy management of labor as a whole. Perón's solution was twofold. First, he appointed as Minister of Labor Juan Maria Freire. You'll never hear from him again. He was an op obscure labor leader who presented little risk of creating competitive loyalties from among the working classes. Second, as for the personal touch that workers continued to expect rather than submitting to the impersonal processes of a cold bureaucracy to respond to their needs, Perón signaled that Evita would receive them and hear their cases from a space set up in the post office headquarters. Within months, Evita abandoned that space and set herself up in the Ministry of Labor proper. At no point did Perón make an announcement that he had designated Evita to act as his official appointee to deal with the, doc with the descamisados. She had no official designation, no title, yet she made decisions involving huge amounts of federal funds, either bypassing or directly instructing the Ministry of Labor and his staff to follow up on her determinations. The results of this arrangement were multiple and depending on where you stood on the political spectrum, they were considered to be either corrosive of institutional and democratic practices or designed to raise the status of Evita, now seen as a personal servant of the people and an extension of the president. Evita thus acted in multiple ways as Perón's surrogate and advocate, as a delegate to union activities, as a resource to labor's projects by engaging the services of labor ministry staff, as a spokeswoman who gave speeches in Perón's name, and as the ultimate source of the workers' well-being in Perón's name. She presented herself in public as little more than his servant on behalf of the people, the pueblo, while at the same time excoriating the elites, which as I said, she consistently labeled as the oligarchy. She thus became the principal agent of the Peronist state 
propaganda me mechanism. One of the more important things that we should note at this point is that the Peronist state cultivated ambivalence. That is, it tried to satisfy both the owners of the means of production, in other words, the industrialists, and the mass of workers who toiled in their factories. Peronism was not revolutionary in the sense that the state did not become the owner of the means of production, nor was it economically autocratic in the sense of centralizing economic planning. Instead, the Peronist state tensely threaded a weave aimed at producing results for both sides while retaining the role of central arbiter. And in this sense, the state was not autocratic, but rather hegemonic. When, Ev when Evita lambasted the so-called oligarchy while promoting the material conditions of labor, she was expressing only one aspect of the Peronist state's ambivalence. When the Peronist state put in, a place, put in place a political economy strategy designed to defend and advance Argentine industrialists, it, it, it showed a very different aspect. And in the end, seeming contradictions all work to promote a fragmentation of views and political stands on the part of the administrators, which only Perón could resolve. The running joke at the time in Buenos Aires was that of Juan Perón's motorcade standing at a red light at an intersection. His chauffeur asked, my general, what should I do when the light turns green? And Perón replies, turn on the left indicator and make a right. The strategy of formulating policies and enacting practices aimed at satisfying the material interests of seemingly adversarial groups could be accomplished only by a patrimonial state that was rich enough in resources that its multiple patron-client relationships could be simultaneously leveraged. And immediately after the end of the Second World War, Argentina was extraordinarily wealthy, measured by its foreign trade surpluses alone. Great Britain had prohibited the remittance of proceeds from its purchases from other countries during the war. Argentine wartime exports of foodstuff, foodstuffs to the uh, Allies was extraordinary, and the millions of pounds sterling owed to Argentina accumulated in the hallways of the Bank of England. With the end of the war, a good amount of these sums became available to the Perrin estate which used it to lubricate the machinery of its largesse to both workers and industrialists. The Argentine post-war environment witnessed a political economy that celebrated and projected autarky, fancy term for economic self-sufficiency, along with patrimonial labor relations. These were policies that advocated a certain level of redistributive practices favoring urban and organized labor, along with a new and muscular projection of national pride and wealth. And it was in these two areas that Evita found her niche. Once installed as the nation's first lady, Evita took on a public persona that combined, combined public glamour with public service, all of it enhanced by a carefully crafted public relations machinery. In 1947, the Pink House organized a tour by Evita of European capitals, characterized not as an official diplomatic effort, but instead as a goodwill, goodwill tour designed to promote Argentina's wealthy and sophisticated image among war-ravaged Europeans. 
dubbed the Rainbow Tour, reflecting the designation of Evita by some of her supporters as the Rainbow of Argentina, the trip was triggered by the invitation of pre by, to President Perón by General Francisco Franco, the fascist dictator of Spain. Perón, however, was in no position of being seen as cozying up to fascists at a time when it was trying to shed the widespread view that he and fellow officers in the military government had held pro-Axis sentiments. I should note that Argentina finally declared war on the Axis five weeks before Germany's surrender. But Argentina could not send, could, could instead send its most dazzling export and then dilute the perception of any cozy relationship with Franco by adding other European capitals, including Paris, Rome, Zurich, and London. Depending on whose side of the deep political divide you stood, the tour was either a success or an embarrassment. In Switzerland, she had some stones and tomatoes thrown at her direction, and Buckingham Palace quietly let it be known that the royal family could not give Evita an audience, but was not against welcoming her to the country as a regular visitor. Reportedly, Evita never forgot nor forgave. No matter. The Peronist propaganda machinery arranged for a splendorous welcome upon her return. Evita's second area of effort was in charitable work, which operated as an extension of the Peronist program of social justice, but again, she never acted or represented herself as a government official. She did represent herself, however, as an extension of Perón, identified as leader of the masses. And she also cultivated the persona of a philanthropic, emotive caretaker. As mentioned earlier, the charitable society, the Sociedad de Beneficencia, had been since its creation in 1825, the best known and largest voluntary welfare organization. The elite women who headed it were closely connected with the men who wielded formal power in the legislature and the executive. Their well-oiled operation delivered benefits with a nearly clinical efficiency. However, Evita Perón would change all that. It would not be until she came on the scene as a child and family welfare advocate herself that Argentines witnessed what historian Donna Guy called emotive philanthropy, that is, welfare as an effective good, as a means of reaching out to the people. This had not been the case with either society ladies or with feminists. Instead, whether it was the conservatives of feminists or feminists, their efforts in addressing child welfare was founded on duty, benevolence, charity, and equality. Love, however, was outside their discourse, except of course, one imagines, in the case of their own children. But Evita would become Argentina's first lady in 1945, identified herself as spiritual mo mother of all children. And ironically, she had no children of her own. She evoked this persona by initiating a very different public effort. Her performance involved handing, handling and kissing babies, not as a member of the cadre of government officials seeking election, that remained the role of, main, of men, but as a conduit linking welfare with the consolidation of power through popular support. She began her charity work in earnest in mid-1946, soon after individuals in the opposition worked to deny her the presidency of the Sociedad de Beneficencia. 
The organization's presidency was customarily awarded to the nation's first lady. Not this time. Evita's rough edges showed in her response to those she perceived as rebuffing her, particularly when the respected when, when, when the suspicion was of a class bias. In this case, she instigated a government investigation of the Sociedad de Beneficencia's financial practices and ultimately its takeover and purge of its leadership. Finally, she founded a rival organization, the Social Assistance Foundation, soon to be renamed the Eva Perón Foundation. Think of Carmela Soprano as working outside the home. This was the way in which the family of the Perones extended out to their political ends. Finally, in the realm of national political uh, politics proper, Evita led a campaign for women's political emancipation that resulted in the enfranchisement of women in 1947. Without an official designation or assigned duties, Evita's power was largely unchecked. But her self-promotion was also unchecked. And it might be surprising to learn that Evita, who had been highly effective in promoting herself and in achieving wide recognition at a remarkably early age, cultivated her persona as a woman in very traditional ways. She never presented herself as powerful, nor did she identify herself as Perón's equal. Instead, the married Evita, who never appeared to know her place, as I used to say, always proclaimed that she was acting as Perón's faithful and submissive servant. But Evita was, after all, an actress. And by this, I don't mean to suggest fakery. I mean that she was theatrical, expansive, filled with demonstration of an affective, affective human touch. One of the clearest examples of her abilities to extend the human component to public acts came from her role as an advocate of the poor and as an agent to change the role of women who since 1825 had been given responsibility by the state for acts of charity. Historically, their functions had been modest affairs relegated to newspaper society pages. But Evita treated welfare very differently. Her acts were covered in the front pages of some newspapers and often presented with political footing. In addition to newspaper coverage, radio coverage and newsreels projected and enhanced the image of personal involvement in getting things done on behalf of those in needs. Her soap opera days on the radio bore fruit. She became a conduit between state authority and the masses in the most effective ways you can imagine. Yet her power was not of the sort that in any way rivaled that of Perón. Indeed, she consistently presented herself as his servant. Evita published her autobiography entitled La Razón de Mi Vida, or The Reason for My Life in 1951, as described by Maria del Carmen Sichato at the University of Waterloo, more than being thought of as a propaganda piece for the Peronist government, the autobiography employs a melodramatic component to self-presentation that neatly conformed to the tastes of the country's mid 20th century popular culture. Here is an, an excerpt of that melodrama that projected vis-a-vis -vis her husband, Evita's submissive position and emphatically grateful frame of mind. If it weren't for him who came down to my level and taught me how to fly in a different way, I would never have known what is a condor. 
and I would never have contemplated the marvelous and magnificent immensity of my people. This is why neither my life nor my heart belong to me and nothing of what I am or have is mine. Everything I am, everything I have, everything I think and everything I feel belongs to Perón. That's melodrama. Evita's postures regarding her traditional roles of men and women persisted long past her lifetime. Among parents, parentless women activities and beyond. In interviews conducted in the, in, in the late 1980s with parentless women, the historian Daniel James recounts the conversations he held with Doña Maria, a parentless party precinct captain in one of the working class neighborhoods in the outskirts of Buenos Aires. Doña Maria expressed a clear sense of the model parentless woman. She describes the scenario of an ideal marriage based on mutual respect and understanding between husband and wife. At different times throughout her story, she emphasized her acceptance of the role of the good wife as traditionally defined in Argentine society and tolerating her husband's activities outside the home. In a speech that Doña Maria gave to her fellow parents, she said, the home is the place where the great national principles are nurtured. The home is the very image of the fatherland, the fortress of the nation itself where the mothers sing to their children about the hope for a better world. Within the home, the invincible force is the woman. It is the woman who in her silent sacrifices turns over the blood of the blood, her children, in order to defend the nation. She is the people in the face of any state. Doña Maria affirmed the role of motherhood and childbearing, opposed divorce and abortion. Evita died of cancer in July of 1952, a month after her 33rd birthday. Three years later, Perón would be toppled by a military coup and sent into exile. Both husband and wife left a legacy that remains polarizing, legendary, modernizing, authoritarian, democratizing all at once the products of their own track record of ambivalence and contradiction. Evita occupied a privileged position in the Peronist hierarchy. She appeared with Peron in all official acts, except notably in military acts. And she stood by his side while the vice president stu stood in the background. But she had no major impact on policy decisions whether on matters of labor, efforts at nationalization, or foreign policy. Evita's leadership was defined by her absolute deference to Perón's authority and to his personal attributes. She adulated him shamelessly. Her insistence on adulation, adulation and obedience served to create an atmosphere of submission to him and a cult figure for both of them. Evita served to extend Peronism charismatic leadership. She weaved labor and the working classes into Peronism and extended Peron's social policies to other groups, including women. But she was no feminist. She urged women to become politically active, to be militant activists, but to do so without forgetting, in her words, their duties as women. And yet importantly, she turned politics, which had traditionally been a male domain, into a legitimate activity for women. Her death unleashed an unprecedented outpouring of her laboring class benefactors and beyond. <clears throat> 
So thank you for your patience. I'm sorry I ran a bit over. I was warned by my f first wife. But any questions that you have now would be most welcome. So that was great. Norma, could you unmute yourself and then ask the question? My question is, is the lingering feeling about her more positive or negative? I, I think the polarization on Perone remains um, less vibrant than it was for many decades. Um, after all, a long time has passed, but although perhaps less emotional and less emotive, the perceptions given to her um, remain pretty consistent, even if they're less, um, they're less um, uh, heated. Mm -hmm. So you think that, that, did she do more good than bad? Um, my people don't do binaries like that. By my people, I mean historians. Um, she was part of a process um, that for a while had a positive impact in some redistribution of um, real income. It modernized the state and state labor relations, much as the New Deal did in its own way in the US. Um, but um, this may sound familiar to the days we live in. She, she made up the rules as she went along. And in that process, there was an extraordinary amount of malfeasance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had a cousin who lived there, and when I spoke with her about it, their impression was very negative. Right, and oh, if you had yeah. spoken, if you had spoken to non-family members on the other side, yeah, it would have been yeah. very positive. I think I think supporters, as all supporters are are likely to do, um, forgive <laughs> the petty sins, and the opposition raises them to the highest level. But the informality of her um, participation in the Peronist um, apparatus lend, uh, lends herself to becoming um, informal in the ways that millions and millions of dollars um, were uh, recruited and spent. We have a question from Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi, Mark. Um, thanks. That was really a tour de force, and I appreciated it. And then, I'll tell my first wife. <laughs> uh, <laughs> tell, you, tell, you, tell, tell all your wives. Uh, my, uh, you know, as a graduate student, I, I studied the Peron era, uh, but never got a sense of who Evita really was, and, and you brought her alive in a way that... Uh, um, that she, she never had been for me. The other thing, but what I wanted to ask you about is that, you know, after, after graduate school, I lived for several years in the Philippines and the parallels between the Perones and the Marcoses are just so striking to me. And between Evita and Imelda, also very striking. Cl clearly there are important differences. And I know your people don't do this kind of thing, <laughs> but I wonder whether you would be willing to um, do any anything by way of, of comparison or how historians think about the the the, the parallels or, or the differences between these two couples. Right. I, I think that um, th there are there are um, authoritarian regimes with female spouses who have historically enhanced and humanized the authoritarian males with wives who stand splendorously, right? So um, 
the the price of shoes went up dramatically in the Philippines um, with um, with the collection by the first lady. She dressed uh, very handsomely. In the same way, Evita, during the first, um, I would say, year to year and a half, was um, Christian Dior and more every week. She dressed spectacularly. And I don't know, um, I'm not an observer of these things, but you might have noticed at the very start with some of the slides, the woman had a head of hair like nobody else. And her hair was a statement, her dues were statements unto themselves. And I think that there is a functional role in the sense of enhancing the persona of the leader uh, in the Philippines, in Egypt, in Argentina, in a number of places where the wives serve, and I don't mean this uh, negatively, as tools, as enhancement tools for an authoritarian leader. And I think in that regard, there's some commonality. The problem is that Mrs. Marcos lived to a ripe old age um, and uh, Marcos himself held on for quite a bit of time. Evita was, was dead in no time at all. So we'll never know the extent to which her enhancement would, would have gone forward. Having said that, when she started working actively as the welfare minister without such a title, she wore uh, suits and tamped down her considerable array of gowns. Although they both, they own two uh, poodles. So that was glamorous. <laughs> so I, I have a question in the chat box and it's uh, what biography of Evita would you recommend? There is, um, to me, the, the best one is by Frazier, F-R-A-S-E-R, and Navarro, N-A-V-A-R-R-O, um, entitled, dramatically enough, Evita. That's and it, it's the curious thing, and, and this, this resonates with what, um, uh, some of what Steve was saying. The curious thing is that um, professional historians and political scientists of Latin America and of Argentina in particular pay very little attention to Evita. She was like ancillary, um, but you, you cannot, I don't know that you can make the argument that without her in the picture, Peronism would, would, would have been the same. I mean, there's, there's a lot of chemistry both in the couple and in her connection with the working classes that Peron, who's not particularly, you know, warm, uh, would have been able to achieve. So it's, it's I think, a sad thing that uh, her life hasn't been treated to, hasn't been subjected to more study and more analysis. Ed, you need to unmute. Okay. Um, making the rounds on Twitter today is the picture of Trump standing on the Truman balcony <laughs> and with a hashtag, the orange Evita. Could you tell me your thoughts on this? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> You're too good for that's, that. That's, that's sort of the performative uh, aspect that I that I spoke about. Um, I don't see Mr. Trump um, in the balcony as a, a colorful version of Evita. I've always thought of his postures much more along the lines of Mussolini um, mm -hmm. in Rome in the 1920s and 30s. Well, that was another um, thought that people had. It didn't yeah. remind them of the Mussolini on the balcony also. Yeah. But the orange Vita, I thought was clever, but I didn't quite understand it. I think you've really explained it. Yeah, but, uh, it yeah. was. A, it, they, I don't think they su they would m suggest that Peron is Dutch. Let's <laughs> leave it at that. Okay, Kathy, uh, um, Mark, that was wonderful. Um, you mentioned how wealthy Argentina used to be, 
And um, it's become in the past four or five decades a serial defaulter. So my question is, do you think there's any thread between Peronism and what happened later economically or is it an irrelevant factor? No, I, 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 think, I think the, the Peronist trajectory of um, political economy and state, uh, state expenditures follows the path of many other countries who in the second half of the 20th century were blessed with oil with the notable exception of Norway, right? Um, that is to say a state that uh, is flush with capital and doesn't quite spend it in forward-looking ways and instead spends it with immediacy of returns of, of a political sort. Now, if prices remain high, whether it's beef, cereal, or oil, nothing to lose, but it's not sustainable. And so by 1950, so we, we get a little bump in our economic well-being, courtesy of the Korean War, and at a, the, 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 the dark, um, black humor among Latin Americanists is that Latin Americans have loved world wars and big wars because then your, your staple exports um, go up and export-led growth can, can take place. But at the end of the Korean War, commodity prices fell once again and the Argentine state had once again to recalibrate its expenditures. And it's caught in a bind, the bind between its largesse to industrialists and its largesse to uh, labor. If times are good, both parties invariably get along. But when the slices get thinner and thinner and the state has to make a choice, um, they become adversaries uh, as they did. But to your question specifically, it seeds no future um, so that you see periods of that kind of benevolent largesse by flush periods in the Argentine economy followed by downturns. And that's just been a history. The Perones made a spectacle of it, but that's been the history in general. We, we can see the same thing happens uh, in Venezuela we, we talked about before. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mark, for Thank an you all for being here. And thanks um, for I, our IT director, Liz and, and, uh, and Gloria. <laughs> so thank, thank you. And thank you to the audience for your thoughtful questions and comments. And I hope to see you at some of our upcoming programs. Um, don't forget next week's Civil War talk. Um, so um, stay well, stay healthy, and have, have a good evening.